I'm Dr. Dan Morris of N1 Health at Winsong. Welcome. We're here tonight to discuss nutrition, the various food groups, macro and micronutrients, and we'll be solving a mystery and having some fun. Thanks for your participation. Well, thanks for coming. Welcome. And I, I don't want this to be real formal, like I'm the professor up here and I'm going to tell you the way it is. Uh, as you know, this whole nutrition thing is open for debate and we could spend a, a lot of time uh, debating the benefits of one micronutrient or phytochemical versus another. But uh, I want you to all have, have fun here and uh, we'll talk about some basics of, of, of definitions of what uh, you know, a protein is, what is a, a sugar in a, in a chemical sense, and then how do they all relate and looking at some of their structures. And I want to start out with um, a mystery. And this mystery uh, will be something for you to think about during the, the talk. And then at the, at the end, we'll, we'll see if we can figure the, mes the answer to the mystery out. Now, we all know that we're, we're in this epidemic of disease in, in the modern world with diabetes and obesity and heart disease and cancer. And we uh, are told that we need to just balance our diet. We need to eat the right amount of proteins and carbohydrates and fats and everything will be better. But then if you look at some of the primitive so-called cultures that are still around in the world that, that we all, origin our ancestors came from after all, at some point back in dark history, we can, uh, we can learn something about what, uh, uh, what's going on. And here's the mystery. Okay, well, first of all, we have the, uh, the Inuit tribesmen in uh, Greenland. They eat mostly seal blubber. Okay? They have very little green leafy vegetables, obviously. <laughs> so, they're, so they're eating, eating uh, seal blubber as a main part of their diet. They have very low rates of heart disease, cancer, diabetes. Now, why is that? How could that be? And so there's, there's the fat intake. Now we have Central American Indians who eat mostly corn and beans and maybe some squash. So that's all carbohydrates. And how could a, a diet of mostly carbohydrates keep these people so healthy? They have a very low rate of diabetes and heart disease and cancer. And then you take the Maasai tribe in Africa and they drink the blood of their cattle. They eat the cattle's meat. They drink the cow's milk without pasteurizing it or, or uh, defatting it. And they also have a low rate of cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. So here we have each food group uh, represented. We have the fats the carbohydrates and the proteins, diets which are predominantly f for each one of those, those uh, populations, and we have low rates of disease. So that's what I want you to think about as we go through this. Why, why is that, and why are we so different? So going into uh, just definitions of, of nutrients uh, and nutrition in general, we have these three main, main groups that we talk about. And we talk about carbohydrates and fats and proteins, but there are other nutrients too, which uh, well the big one, of course, is, is, the, uh, is water. We all uh, need to drink water. We can easily become dehydrated, especially since our drive to drink water reduces as we get older. So, and then doctors will put you on diuretics and other medicines that make you dehydrated. We live in a desert. So yeah, we got to drink our water. So don't forget that as a major nutrient. So uh, the thing we talk a lot about fats and how how fats uh, can make us gain weight, and it's worthwhile to look at the amount of energy that we get from a fat versus a carbohydrate or a protein. We get nine calories for each gram of a fat versus only four calories for a protein or a carbohydrate. So you can see that the calorie density in fats is much greater. That's one reason why if we're trying to maintain our weights, we're going to go with the green leafy stuff because there's just low cal lower calorie density. 
So we've defined up the nutrients into the macronutrients that we just talked about, and the micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, trace elements, and then you have the phytochemicals and all the things you can buy from supplements, and they keep coming up with more and more of these. So that uh, I'll talk about later on. Uh, looking, at, looking at the carbohydrates, we divide those into the sugars, and then the, which are the simple carbohydrates, and then the complex carbohydrates, um, such as uh, glycogen and other starches, plant starches and animal starches. So um, what we have with, uh, now this looks really complicated. Uh, here we are, but the reason I brought this up is that it's worthwhile to look at just the ring structure of glucose, which everybody says, well, okay, glucose is the problem with diabetes. We have too much glucose. You have hyperglycemia. It's blood sugar. Uh, what's the problem here? We've got to get this down. Uh, so it sounds like glucose is a poison, but actually glucose is the fuel of your body. Every organ in your body needs glucose. Uh, if you're hypoglycemic, you pass out, your heart stops. So glucose has to be maintained in your system, and there are many pathways in your metabolism to maintain a proper glucose level in your bloodstream. And if it goes too high, then you'll get symptoms, and insulin will be produced by your pancreas, and to try to lower the, the glucose level by moving the glucose into the tissues. And then the insulin itself will start causing problems. The pancreas will get sick. You may end up with diabetes type 2 converting to diabetes type 1 and needing to take insulin shots. And it's just a horrible cascade of, of problems. So the thing to remember, though, is that glucose is the fuel of your body, and, and you need it. Now, why don't we just eat a lot of glucose? Well, in a sense, we do, because in our diets, we have what's called glycogen. And glycogen is the same thing as potato starch. It's just glucose molecules stuck together by a simple hydroxyl bond. So the long strings of this glucose stuck together is glycogen or starch. Now, it takes your body only one step chemically to move from a glycogen to a sugar. So your body stores this glycogen in your liver, and then as you need it, it breaks off glucose to maintain your, your blood level of, of glucose so that you maintain your metabolism and you stay conscious and alert and all your organs work properly. Uh, things go wrong when your body stores too much of the glycogen, and then you're, uh, you're consuming more calories than you need, and you start storing triglycerides, or fat, in your liver that then confuses the liver, and it becomes inflamed, and you can get actually fatty liver disease from having too many calories, and that uh, leads to more problems, as we know. So what I'm, what I, one thing I want to get at here is that your um, sugars are divided into... Oh, we're going back to fat. So anyway, we've got the glucose, but table sugar is a disaccharide. It's, it's a combination of two simple monosaccharides. And one of them is a five-pointed uh, ring, whereas glucose is six. So if you take table sugar and eat that, your body responds to that less emphatically than just eating a potato. A potato will raise your blood sugar quicker than eating an equivalent amount of table sugar because of this simple bond. That's why we recommend that if you're going to eat a potato and you have any kind of blood, or sh blood sugar problem at all, that you throw in a lot of fiber and other nutrients that will slow the release of the sugar into your bloodstream. And we'll get into what's called the glycemic index. So here's glycemic index versus glycemic load. And this represents the response of your body to a given amount of a certain food. And this, uh, this has been receiving a lot of press because uh, people say, well, if I have a blood sugar problem, do I really want to eat something that's going to raise my sugar that high? And there's been some confusion about it. Like, for example, uh, carrots have gotten a bad rap as uh, having a high glu glycemic index. So by doing other calculations, it's come to, 
to the point where we now have a different scale. It's called the glycemic load. And that takes into account the typical portion size and the amount of fiber you're eating with it. And so that gives a more realistic picture of what this food is actually going to do to your system. And so the glycemic load is much more, much more accurate. And you can see here that when you compare the glycemic uh, index and the glycemic load of something like uh, um, carrots, which I don't see on here, but you'll find that, that it actually shows that, uh, that the uh, glycemic load is much lower and does less harm to your blood sugar level than if you'd calculated a glycemic index factor. So that's something that uh, I thought I should bring up. So here's uh, moving along to fats then. So fats are the big culprit, you know, fats in your diet, we'll talk about, oh, you can't, you don't want to have fats, fats will raise your cholesterol level, and cholesterol is the deposits in your arteries that causes heart attacks and, and uh, uh, kidney failure and peripheral artery disease. But you still need fats, you still need cholesterol. Every cell in your body has a cell membrane that's made from cholesterol. Your liver makes cholesterol. So what we're talking about here is getting out of balance, where you have too much fat, too much cholesterol. Your body looks for places to put it, and it tends up depositing it in your arteries. So uh, the uses of, of fat in your body, of course, are to store uh, energy when, in times of uh, famine uh, in centuries past. You, know, you would be more likely to survive a famine if you had extra fat deposits. We're beyond that now. But uh, as you can see, the, the Inuit tribesman is heavier and is deposited more fat than, than the Maasai because he lives in a cold environment and that uh, stimulates fat uh, deposition so that uh, they stay warm. You also uh, have a more rapid metabolism. And then we talk about good fats versus bad fats. And this, this waxes and wanes and the, the pendulum swings back and forth. You know, we, we were told that uh, butter was bad and that margarine was good and then margarine's bad and then you needed to have butter or uh, you needed to have a soft margarine or switch to um, vegetable oils entirely. And I want to spend a little time talking about this and how this all came about. And part of that is that hard fat or saturated fat, animal fat in general is, is a hard saturated fat, that is uh, solid at room temperature. And uh, back in the, what is it, the 60s or so, we came up with the idea of, of switching over to a, a, a fat or a butter substitute like margarine. And using this in a, a tub form so that uh, it was uh, not the hard fat, it was a softer fat. And uh, so, uh, excuse me a second. So what happened then was we started uh, hydrogenating vegetable oils in terms of putting more, uh, uh, more of the strong bonds between the chemical structures of the fats. And the reason for this was to prolong the shelf life, for one thing, and also to uh, um, improve uh, on, the, on the consistency of it. And what we found was that this actually, this saturated fat or hydrogenated vegetable oil was associated with higher risk of heart disease. So then we had to backpedal and say, well, hey, this stuff is as bad or worse than butter. So that's what led us then to think, okay, well, maybe the saturated fats in general are something we should avoid and we should go with the monounsaturated or the polyunsaturated fat. So what in the heck am I talking about anyway? What is a saturated fat versus unsaturated fat? As you can see here, the, um, the hard fat or saturated fat here is, is solid at room temperature. Butter is solid at room temperature. Oil is not. Now, you can see also that the um, the fatty acids in the saturated fat are very consistent and they tend to line up and stack up easily. And I think it's good to see this as an analogy with what's going on in your arteries. The saturated fat is more likely to promote deposition of 
fat deposits in your arteries, whereas the oil, which is a liquid at room temperature, has more of these unsaturated bonds so that it, it has a more um, twisted or space-occupying configuration, so it's not as likely to kind of stack up and become a solid, either at room temperature or in your body. So we're looking here now at, at uh, saturated fats in, in your diet, and um, some of the uh, uh, vegetable fats uh, have uh, definitely more of the saturated fat than lard or duck fat or butter. So we have to be really careful just because it's, it's a plant doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best thing for you. Coconut oil is used a lot, palm kernel oil is used a lot, and you'll see these because they prolong the shelf life of packaged goods like um, chips, crackers, all of those baked goods, the pastries that you can get from, from uh, the grocery store, those all have these saturated fats to prolong the shelf life. That's good for the company that makes them, it's good for the grocery store, but it's not good for your arteries. And so when you see hydrogenated vegetable oil, you're probably looking at this, uh, this stuff in terms of the uh, tropical oils, as we say. So then we go into uh, the uh, essential versus the non-essential uh, fatty acids. There's two essential fatty acids that you cannot live without. That's linoleic acid and alpha-linoleic acid, or ALA. Now, the, your body has the ability to convert the linoleic acid into the alpha-linoleic acid to a small degree, and this varies from person to person. And that's one thing that we test for when we do the saliva DNA test. We uh, collect DNA that then can tell us if your body and your genetics make you more likely or less likely to be able to make this conversion and then we can make dietary recommendations based on that. Now, you'll probably recognize the ALA because it's the, the one omega-3 oil that you can get quite, quite well from plants. The other two, the uh, DHA and the EPA, are almost exclusively from animal products, namely fish or krill or the zooplankton that you get from uh, the oceans, or from kelp, and there are certain yeasts that make it too. But this allows, uh, allows you to uh, have the really good omega-3 oils that are associated with reduction in uh, all kinds of diseases, cancer, stroke, um, and de even depression has been uh, shown to improve with uh, taking omega-3 supplements or eating a lot of omega-3 source uh, seafood. And this shows you the uh, amounts of omega-3 in various uh, food sources. You can see that there, uh, the plants are listed. The broccoli has some, but that's going to be your ALA. Um, eggs have some, but there again, that's mostly the ALA. So your uh, your uh, seafood-based sources are uh, a good choice, and also the kelp uh, depicted by this picture. So that moves us along to proteins, and proteins are, are uh, especially interesting because uh, we have associate those with, okay, you have to have lots of protein to be strong and build muscle, and so you, all the bodybuilders are having protein supplements, uh, the uh, uh, creatine and all these other type of uh, bodybuilding supplements that will help supposedly build muscle. But uh, you have to look at that with some bit of skepticism because there is a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, there are essential um, amino acids and there are non-essential amino acids. So what's an amino acid? An amino acid is a building block for protein. And there are tens of thousands of proteins in your body. Each one of them is coded for by a specific gene. That's how your DNA works. 
your DNA gives the coded information to your body to make proteins. And so those proteins then have specific functions in your body as enzymes, as triggers for other processes to take place. So it's really crucial that we get all of our essential amino acids. And there was misinformation in the past, say, well, you gotta have animal source products. You gotta be able to eat your beef, pork, chicken, whatever, in order to get enough of the essential amino acids to be healthy. But we've proven that that's not true over the years. The, we've known uh, that, uh, well, these diets, uh, like for the Central American Indians, they have mostly beans and corn. Those form a complete set of amino acids so that uh, you uh, don't have a deficiency. And there are nine or 10 of these. I think there are 10 of the essential ones listed uh, one of them uh, is more relates to childhood, and then the other uh, nine are, uh, are essential for all of us, even as adults. And then there's about 10 of the non-essential. So each one of these can fit together with their um, other members of the list and form proteins uh, in different ways. So I wanted to put this up just to show, as I said, there are more than uh, <coughs> a few ways to get protein, and it doesn't have to be from animal products. You can be healthy and you can be completely vegan. You can be healthy and be a nutritarian or flexitarian or lacto-vegetarian, you name it. There are plenty of different combinations for a healthy life, and we have to find our own path uh, as we, we search for what's right for us. And this, uh, slide represents all of the colorful vegetables and fruits that you can imagine that have so many different micronutrients. In other words, the phytochemicals, the vitamins, and the um, other substances that, that are essential for our well-being. And we keep coming out with new lists of these all the times of, of well, this, uh, Re, uh, resveratol was, certain, was recently found in grapes uh, to be uh, something they also found in wine and that this was really good for your, your uh, circulation and good to prevent heart disease, but then uh, subsequent studies are finding some questions about how your response to exercise isn't as good if you, if you take resveratrol. So there's, there's this debate going on. And what um, what I think is uh, worthwhile in terms of the vitamins is to look back at the history of vitamins and the history of, of science, which has always been to try to dissect things into smaller and smaller sizes and look under the microscope, get a stronger microscope, find out what the subatomic particle is, and you know, you just, uh, they just uh, got uh, the Nobel Prize awarded in physics for the discovery of the Higgs uh, boson, one of those those uh, uh, subatomic particles, which uh, uh, really helps us understand the universe. And the thinking's been in other forms of science too, like in nutrition and biology and in medicine, look further and further for the key. And what I propose that we've lost sight of here is that we don't look enough at the whole and look at the whole foods, for example. What the pharmaceutical industry and the National Institutes of Health have spent a lot of time on is looking for the antidote for our problem, which is this <laughs> epidemic we're, we're having of heart disease, cancer. So there must be some, some answer, some antidote, or some cause that we just need to take this one thing out of our diet or take this one pill to counteract what it is. And I'm proposing that that's not really the answer that the answer is to, rather than just take the lycopene out of the tomato and put it in a, a capsule and take the lycopene, eat the tomato. You'll get the fiber, you'll get a lot of nutrients that aren't even listed as, as ingredients in a tomato because they haven't been discovered yet or their uses haven't been discovered yet. And one thing that... Um, has come up is the ANDI score, the Aggregate Nutrient Density Index, and this is something that Dr. Furman came up with, and you probably have 
heard his name bandied about the office. He's an MD with a family medicine background who has devoted his, his career to reversing this epidemic of uh, nutritional disease in, in America and the world in general. And so he took, he went to all of the effort to take all of the micronutrients and macronutrients that are known and then make a, a list based on the quality of that food, ranging from a thousand down to one, and determine the value of that food to your body. As you can see, cola is down at the bottom of the one, and there are other things. Pepsi would fit here too, and Mountain Dew, although Mountain Dew has probably more caffeine. So, uh, and then up here, we've got the really good green leafy vegetables, the kales that have just a plethora of micro and macronutrients, fiber, and these are rated a thousand, and then everything else fits in between. So that's taking uh, uh, the macronutrient qualities and the micronutrients to an extreme to try to get you some idea of when you're looking at a foodstuff, is this something I should eat or not? And if I do eat it, how much should I eat? Now, I'm starting to circle back then to our our problem with the mystery, the mystery of the three cultures. And what I'd like to do now is just open it up. To, does anybody have any idea of what's going on there? How is this mystery to be solved? I mean, what happens with, uh, with these cultures? What, what, uh, what's their secret? Does uh, anybody have an idea? The wine they drink. Yeah. <laughs> what's that, wine? They don't drink wine? That could be part of it, yeah. There you go. Whole, whole, foods. whole foods. They're eating whole foods even though it's a whole seal's blubber <laughs> that, that, that it's still a whole food. And it grew, they're, they're using it, they're consuming it where it grew. And, and their, uh, their, go, their genetics also go back uh, centuries as to how they adapted. Yes, Eileen? That was it. Evolved. There you go. I took the words out of your mouth. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bill. Uh, they, uh, you could group them in with the Hunza also. Mm -hmm. uh, North Afghanistan is, they don't eat any sugar. Interesting. And they, they drink the yak's milk and, and uh, have and the, probably very few green leafy vegetables. They get up at dawn and they go to bed and it's dark. Yes, the cycle. And yeah. they exercise all day long. Sure. Usually. And they don't drive around in cars and breathe smoggy air and, and watch, watch a lot of TV, that sort of thing. So, yeah, so if you take that to the extreme then, or, or take that a step further, what happens when a Maasai or an Eskimo or a Central American Indian moves to America? Right away, they, they adopt our culture of fast food, processed food, lots of... Uh, uh, pesticide residues, chemicals in their diet, smog, stress. The stress is a factor. Doc, what is, what is processed food? I've heard that term. Okay, <laughs> this is what I like to call the silence of the yams. Because, <laughs> because when you walk in the store, when the grocery store, you walk into Fry's down there, every, there are all these flashing lights and signs that say, eat this, this has been shown to help prevent heart disease, this breakfast cereal will prevent diabetes, prevent this or that. And then way off on the sides, you see the produce department and the four yams sitting there, and no one's, hey, hey buy this, buy this. And it's nothing malicious, but the um, food uh, manufacturers make their money on processing foods. The truck farmers don't. Also, there are certain subsidies given to large conglomerate farms that grow soybeans, wheat, sugar, the corn, the corn, uh, high fructose corn sweetener. They're just about giving that away thanks to our policies in the, in the FDA, the, uh, in the agriculture department. And this brings me to this. This is the, actually the original food pyramid. When I was in medical school, this is what we were taught to encourage people to eat. And it's based on a foundation of starches. 
And it doesn't say that these are whole grains. It just says they're starches. That's uh, uh, breads, pastas, crackers, you name it. And we know that this stuff makes you gain weight because it uh, puts down calories in the form of, of conversion to fat very rapidly in your system. And it makes you full so that your next part of the meal, the vegetable group, well, I'm already full. I just ate my bread and pasta, so I'm not going to eat any of that. So by processed foods, uh, there's a nice little book called Food Rules by Michael Pollan, and it talks about this, about how there's, there's like 64 rules that you can go by. And, and the three main ones are um, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. So that simplifies <laughs> the whole thing right there. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And so, okay, what's food? Well, food is something your grandmother would recognize as food. It's not a box of cereal. It's, it's okay, they would have oats. She would, she would recommend, your grandmother would probably say, okay, what do you have for breakfast for cereal? Oatmeal, that's it, or maybe cream of wheat, but not Fruit Loops. And so one of the rules is don't eat any breakfast cereal that turns the milk a funny color. Okay. <laughs> so, so those kind of things. And it's, it's really humorous, but there's a lot of good common sense to it. And, that's what, and he goes into this idea of processing, processing foods. And so watch out for any, one of his rules is don't eat anything that has more than five ingredients listed in, on, the, on the nutrient uh, information. Or don't eat anything that a third grader couldn't pronounce. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> So, so these are these are all uh, tips about processed food. Well, that leaves out amaranth, right? Am say that. Amaranth? Well, <laughs> the amaranth, there's an exception to every rule. So, so here's Dr. Furman's uh, food pyramid, and this uh, uh, is uh, shown to has been shown to help reverse diabetes, help prevent diabetes, and this uh, also can be extrapolated to all of the other. Uh, nutritional related uh, disorders we have in our in our society and he's going with vegetables half cooked half raw and then <coughs> fruits beans leg legumes above that whole grains uh, meaning the the grain is whole you know you're you're eating a, a, you know a real corn kernel rather than something that's been extracted from it just the corn starch for example and then uh, twice weekly or less for fish or fat-free dairy, uh, once weekly or less for poultry, eggs, oils, and then rarely having beef, sweets, cheese, milk, processed foods, hydrogenated oils. So he doesn't say never, because you never want to say never, because uh, then that's all you can think about. If you say, I'm never going to have chocolate, I can't have chocolate anymore, then you lay away night thinking about chocolate. So a lot of this is really a, a psychological effect, too. And that's why I emphasize the idea about having fun with this and finding your own path and partnering with our team here at N1 Health. You're, you know, you're the one in N1. You're the, you're the, the uh, one case that makes you special. No one else has your DNA unless you're an identical twin. So we have to take you as an individual, your DNA, your environment, your life history, and work with you to find the best path for you. So uh, with no further uh, ado, I'll uh, open it up to questions or comments, and, and then we'll have some examples of what we're talking about here. But uh, when you eat your, your meal, the, the main thing in your, on the plate should be the vegetables, and the, the meat should be like a condiment, and the starches should be like a condiment. But the green leafies, the colorful vegetables with all the great uh, micronutrients are, are the mainstay of this, uh, this healthy diet.